I gotta say the the first experience I had with a great white or I should say the lead up to the first experience was filled with terror. That's National Geographic explorer Gibbs Kaguru. Gibbs is a Kenyan scientist who studies sharks and he's talking about the first time he dove with great whites. He's on the coast in South Africa. I was certain I was gonna die. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm in this situation. You know, the sea looks a bit choppy. It's gray skies, which is, by the way, perfect sharky conditions. And I'm about to get in a cage. Like, I'm basically like a gummy bear for this, this you know, two-ton <laughs> animal. And I, I put the wetsuit on, and I remember just staring over the edge of the boat into the cage and thinking, you know, this is, this is what my coffin's going to look like. Oh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as you see your first great white, your, I shouldn't say your, my imagination about them being these bloodthirsty man-eaters immediately dissipated because you saw a curious, beautiful, fierce, uh, graceful animal just, you know, enjoying its surroundings. There was no malice or inspired cruelty to its actions, and you could see that. And I, I always tell people that are they're like, man, it must be scary going out to, to work every day. And I'm like, no way. Like once you see what I've seen, you'll never have that, you know, weird notion that these sharks are anything less but just beautiful animals in the wild. I'm Peter Gwynn, editor-at-large at National Geographic, and you're listening to Overheard, a show where we eavesdrop on the wild conversations we have here at Nat Geo and follow them to the edges of our big, weird, beautiful world. This week, we meet a guy who went off to swim with sharks because, well, he didn't know what he was going to do with his life. And in the process, he fell in love with these misunderstood wild creatures. He'll tell us why they drew him in what it's like to free dive with sharks, and what genetics can tell us about these ancient ocean animals. More after the break. Fuel your curiosity with a free one-month trial subscription to Nat Geo Digital. You'll have unlimited access on any device, anywhere, ad-free with our app that lets you download stories to read offline. Explore every page ever published with a century of digital archives at your fingertips. Check it all out for free at natgeo.com slash explore more. Can you sort of paint that scene of the first time you actually put on scuba gear and went and dived with sharks? I was doing this pre-med program and uh, I didn't love it, uh, to be honest. And my study advisor at the time was like, I know you don't love it, and he knew I was not really going to go anywhere with it. Um, so he sends me this bulletin to come dive with sharks in South Africa. This thing that your professor saw, what was it exactly? Was it like a, a, a research project, or was it like a tour company, or what, what was it? Yeah, it was a tour company that took clients out every day to see great whites. You know, you stick them in the cage, they see a whole bunch of great whites, and they leave you know, having their lives absolutely changed. And I thought that was a crazy idea. Uh, Sharks, to me, appeared to be one of the most dangerous things on the planet. But at that stage in my life, I was sort of confronted with uh, two types of fear. Uh, The first was continuing on with this program that I was discontented with deeply uh, for the rest of my life. And... Uh, the second one was get eaten alive potentially by great white, which is, you know, uh, the fear of death. But long story short, I chose the sharks. Um, I chose to don the wetsuit and get in the water because uh, for me, the, the fear of losing a life well lived was far scarier than losing life itself. And being in the water with sharks um, gave me uh, a whole world of new possibilities that I could thrive in and, and love is, is I also found love, uh, for sharks. And yeah, (laughs) I I can't describe it any other way because I I remember the first moment I got a chance to step away from doing shark work. I, I felt like my world was crumbling. 
and I I don't see it going any other way. I think I can I want to do this for as long as I'm physically capable. Well, okay, so that's man, that's super dramatic. So go from you know preparing to take you know the the medical entrance exams versus going to dive with sharks. So, okay. So what happens? You get on a plane and I mean, how do you even begin this process of diving with sharks? Yeah. I mean, the first thing was, you know, improve my competency in the water, uh, which meant learning how to dive, learning how to boat, and then also being comfortable, uh, in a variety of situations with wild animals. And, and that's, that's something that I feel like uh, is, is definitely a skill, but there's also an intuition about, you know, figuring out how an animal thinks, works, and, you know, it also plays into how safe you can be around them. Um, and this is, this is all just comes with, like, time and experience. Um, and six years working at a shark diving company um, was the crash course that I needed to get me to the level where I can be a confident shark scientist. Uh, and then I was an intern there uh, for six months. And you know, after that six months, like I said, I, I had an opportunity to, to walk back and go and take my uh, medical school entry exam. And I was like, hell no, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, put me in the water again, man. Like I, I, I just, I couldn't imagine not doing that. It's one of those things where I don't really remember what life was like before I saw my first great white. It was just seeing great whites and then I'm like, yep, that's it. So how did you get from that into the research part, into the into the sort of the academic world of sharks? Yeah, I felt uh, uninspired with my pre-med program. Um, and for the first time in my life, I, I had wonder again. And that's what pushed me to be like, okay, I have these sharks and I have maybe some academic curiosity. Can I marry these two things together and, you know, learn as much as I can about these animals? So what was it like the first time that you weren't inside a cage when you went down to study sharks? What did that feel like? I mean, I, I know you, 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 you said that you, you got this sense of like, you sense they're not the creatures that we've imagined them to be through your experience with the tour company. But then when you actually get outside the safety of the cage, what does that feel like? Being in the water with sharks is, is it's an out of body experience. You feel like you're being watched and you're sort of a, you're sort of watching yourself being watched by these animals and it's freeing at the same time because it feels like you're suspended in air and there's these things just floating around you just observing you mm -hmm. uh, and most of the time uh, they don't even stick around because you're really not that interesting to them um, <laughs> as far as like a food source goes so they come out, they check you out, they're like, oh, what is this really weird, lanky thing floating in, in my environment? Uh, they check you out for a little bit, and then they, they dart off. And, and those are the moments that make me sad, actually, because I'm like, man, I want to see this thing as much as possible. Um, how do I get it around me? Is, and, and this is why I continue doing what I do, is because that moment when the shark swims away from, from me is like, man, okay, I need to come back tomorrow and do this again so I can spend that much more time with it just to see what it does. Sharks are such a, a topic of conversation in the United States. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about the Jaws effect, but, if, you know, Jaws came out and really colored a lot of people's view of, of sharks in the United States. Well, what do people in Kenya, like growing up, what was the attitude? Was there a similar sort of like perception of them? You know, I think that you're, you're touching on something important there with the Jaws effect. And I think the impact of that film permeated just about every corner of society. Because even growing up in, you know, Nairobi, which is nowhere near the ocean, um, I was under the impression that sharks are dangerous. Um, and I had this notion going, growing up for my entire childhood, even when we went to the beach uh, for the holidays. It was always like, don't go out too far because they're going to get you. Yeah. 
Right. So that's become a universal phenomenon, I guess, the, the, yeah. the monster in the ocean that's lurking out there. I think people need to hear more inspiring shark stories. Um, unfortunately, we had one movie that changed the scope of sharks PR for generations. Um, I think people were sort of inclined to having a fear about things they don't understand. But when that fear was given a face and a name, Jaws, that immediately solidified that in our psyche as, you know, the thing we have to avoid at all costs. And if we can't avoid it, then we have to kill it. And that's just what people do. When we feel vulnerable, we, we want to make sure that there's no way in the future where we'll ever feel threatened again. And this spells the end, not just for sharks, but for a healthy working environment, which is, is what we need too. Can you kind of, you know, for the, for the person listening that doesn't, you know, know a lot about this, could you kind of walk us through the evolutionary history of sharks? Um, yeah. So based on we know, what we know from their genetic history, we see that they predate trees. And that means they've been around for eras. Um, oh my gosh, are you massive... serious? I, I had yeah. no idea. Older than trees? Yeah. Wow. What that tells me is that, you know, these animals are so perfectly designed. They've been around through eras of, of mass extinctions. And that's, that is, is so remarkable, especially when we look at what's happening today when their populations are being forced to adapt to humans and bounce back from the brink of extinction. You know, and, and like I said, humans are the primary cause that's, that's making these animals that have been around for millennia you know, be at risk of extinction. Well, well, tell me a little bit about the impact that humans are having on sharks. I mean, I, I, I take it it's more than one, it's multifaceted. Is there, is there any one particular area of this crisis that you've looked at? The work that I'm doing in the Maldives is, is really based on learning about the direct human impacts on shark populations. Um, over about a 40 or 50 year period, um, people had fished the Maldives out nearly to a uh, population collapse. And then the sharks bounced back. Uh, we thought that it was going to be all fine, but now these sharks are coming back with a skin disease, essentially. And it's, it, it, it looks kind of like spots that you'd get from uh, like just, you know, uh, like a sunspot almost like where where you just lose the ability to create pigment, um, which is, you know, sharks have melanin pigment just like we do, which is actually kind of cool. Um, but they lose this ability and this gene that codes for melanin pigment is linked to so many other functions uh, in, the, in the shark's body as well as ours that it's potentially giving them other um, deformations uh, as far as their development goes. So what, what's the sort of the, the answer to that? I mean, is there some, you know, have you guys isolated a specific sort of cause for that that, that can be addressed? Or um, Again, uh, and th this goes back to that whole complexity of nature. Um, if you break it, it's really difficult to put back together the way it was. And, and over time, we've realized that conservation is, is so vital, not just from a, let's see how many animals we have, but we need to have a diverse array of animals. And I know the term diversity gets thrown around a lot, um, and, and it's in the context of, you know, diverse people, diverse ideas. But when we're talking about genetic diversity, we're really talking about the strength that binds populations together. And without diversity, you eventually breed in weakness. And that's what these sharks are sort of dealing with now is we've just, we've, we've uh, shrunken their gene pool to a gene puddle. And there's not that many uh, genes that can help their potential of survival and their, 
yeah, then you come out with sharks that have spots that aren't able to protect themselves from harmful UV rays and a litany of other problems. One of the things I'd heard is that you'd studied um, about how great white sharks can change their color. I'd never yes. heard that before, man. That is crazy. How does that work? So um, I first heard about sharks changing color from my employer when I worked in the, at the cage diving company. And I remember thinking that was the craziest thing I've ever heard because um, we saw the same shark, but I didn't see it change color, but he, could, he would swear by it. Um, then I went to visit other cage diving companies and they said the same thing. Um, again, me being the skeptic, I thought it was some kind of industry joke that I just wasn't in on. And uh, as we kept going, I started realizing that maybe there is something to this. So we just devised an experiment to expose this. Um, and we being myself and Ryan Johnson, my mentor, um, but <clears throat> we essentially found that great whites do have this ability to modulate their color to be better suited in their environment. And uh, there are um, certain situations where they need to be camouflaged to hunt better, maybe be camouflaged to defend themselves from a larger predator like an orca in their environment. And they'll, you know, go down to the bottom of the ocean where the colors are a lot more muted and they go pale. So there's, there's all the, there's this interplay of using their skin to, um, to be better predators and also a, a less viable prey. Man, that is crazy. One of the other things I'd heard is that they can really heal themselves. Mm. That they have this ability to sort of regenerate uh, quickly after they've been injured or sick. Yeah, we've seen this happen uh, quite a, a number of times with our sharks. Um, you know, on, on any given day, you'll see a great white with this most grievous wound out of its side. And you think, oh, there's no way this thing is going to recover from that. Like an entire chunk of its flesh was removed. And you watch this shark go... Um, around your boat over time and then within a year it's like it was never hurt you know it's like it had never experienced this trauma and what we've also learned uh, through genetics is that these sharks actually have genes that are geared towards this adaptive immunity that essentially gives them you know uh, like a superpower like wolverine where you know they <laughs> can take anything um, physically damaging and recover from it. Um, and I think that is one of the, the coolest discoveries um, about shark adaptations. And it even has biomedical implications because we can potentially, you know, isolate genes like that and use, you know, things like gene therapy to um, assist people who need to you know, I'm just spitballing here, like regrow limbs or recover from cancers. Uh, th the applications are endless, but, you know, we just need to do more research to find out how we can actually use, you know, this ancient animal uh, to fix us, which is cool. What's the thing that surprised you the most during your time working with sharks? Has there been anything that just like blew your mind? Like, wait, I mean, you've already kind of listed a few, a few that have blown, blown my mind, but is there any like shark behavior or, or in a specific encounter where you were like, wow, I, I totally didn't expect that? Yeah, I will say the thing that surprised me the most about sharks was uh, learning about shark social networks. Um, and this was during a very difficult trial I had uh, when I was working in the Maldives um, and I was trying to get tissue samples um, for my PhD study which I'm currently doing so I went and found the the juiciest freshest bloodiest tuna that I could find which anything uh, by sea or land would go crazy for it's good eating um, so I set this tuna on a hook um, and, you know, laid it out in an area where I know these black tip reef sharks would occur. And for two months, I watched every day one of these sharks 
observe my bait and turn away. You know, this was the most delicious meal that I could have prepared for them because it's highly, you know, it's, it's a nice oily fish. It's highly nutritious. And like I said, any animal on sea or uh, at sea or land would, would go crazy for it. Um, and yeah, like any chef um, who's prepared a delicious meal, um, I became <laughs> very despondent. You know, I asked myself, why are these sharks not taking the bait? And as it turns out, these sharks are a lot smarter than they look. And it was for sure not very difficult for them to outsmart me, um, which I took, by the way, very personally. <laughs> Um, and the reason for this, uh, the surprising thing, is that these sharks actually have a cohesive social network that allows them to identify threats in their environment and then collectively avoid them. And interestingly, these sharks have seen fishing gear before. They're a historically overfished population. So they see me, a scientist, uh, coming in with the same fishing gear that a fisherman has used, and they know that is danger. Mm. Um, and there's actually a really interesting paper about this written by Johan Murier, uh, based out in French Polynesia. We know that these sharks are doing this. The crazy thing is we just don't know how. How do they communicate? Um, in any case, uh, through that trial, I, I licked my wounds. I called my buddy Walker. And um, who, by the way, is a world-class waterman. Um, we got a whole bunch of equipment, devised a plan, and then we successfully managed to catch these sharks. Um, through that, you know, my ego took a really big hit because <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd been working with great whites, you know, and these little black tips had managed to, you know, yeah, play me for a fool. Um, it, it taught me a lot of new crucial skills, but one very important lesson I learned is that I actually, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The more you learn, the more you realize you have to learn. Right. Yeah. Um, I saw, I saw what was happening to my sharks. You know, it, it, these animals, which I, I loved so dearly were taking such a hit from people and it, it, it almost, it, it made me feel a little bit helpless because the, the love that I had for them was, was not backed by action. Uh, and that's, that's when I realized I, I got to start talking about this. I got to tell people what's going on, what I'm seeing in the environment, how, how the habitat of these sharks is completely destroyed, how they have no more food sources, and, and the fact that in the midst of all this, people are still going out and collecting jaws as trophies. I, I don't um, I don't know how this is all going to change, but I know that it's it's incumbent upon me who has seen these things, you know, to be the canary in the coal mine and say, hey, this is happening. Are you aware? If you like what you hear and you want to support more content like this, please rate and review us in your podcast app and consider a National Geographic subscription. That's the best way to support Overheard. Go to natgeo.com slash explore more to subscribe. And hey, for more on Gibbs' journey and his research, check out our story about him online. We've also got an article about how great whites change their color to sneak up on prey. Plus, you can watch Gibbs in a National Geographic documentary, Camo Sharks. He and other scientists try to catch sharks in the middle of their color changes. And if you just can't get enough sharks, we got a whole bunch of shark vest stories for you including how drones are changing how we observe and think about sharks. That's all in your show notes, right there in your podcast app. This week's Overheard episode is produced by Alana Strauss. Our other producer is Kyrie Douglas. Our senior producers are Brian Gutierrez and Jacob Pinter. Our senior editor is Eli Chen. Our manager of audio is Carla Wills. Our executive producer of audio is Devar Ardalan. Our photo editor is Julie Howe. Ted Wood's sound designed this episode, and Hansdale Sue composed our theme music. This podcast is a production of National Geographic Partners, the National Geographic Society, committed to illuminating and protecting the wonder of our world, funds the work of National Geographic explorer Gibbs Kaguru. Michael Tribble is the vice president of Integrated Storytelling. 
Nathan Lump is National Geographic's Editor-in-Chief. And I'm your host, Peter Gwynn. Thanks for listening, and see y'all next time.